Thank you, Josh, and good afternoon to everyone. I've really enjoyed interacting with so many of you in previous discussions, and it's a privilege now to discuss a little bit more the framework for concrete bridge deck management practice in Utah. I'm specifically discussing today in terms of scope, cold region states. So those that have winters and canyons and mountains that look like what you see in the picture. This is the environment that we live in. Although Utah does have a warmer desert region to the south, it is the cold weather that drives the performance of bridge decks in our state. And we have approximately 22 to 25 major storms each winter. Each one costs about a million dollars of our maintenance funds. We remove thousands of tons of snow from the roadway and bridges, and we apply an equal amount of salt, as Josh mentioned. In fact, in Utah, the typical application rate of typically sodium or calcium chloride salts is 250 to 300 pounds of chloride per lane mile. And so we see very commonly on the highways these snow plows and plenty of salt being distributed. And of course, because we have a bare pavement policy, we rely on excellent maintenance forces to patrol the pavements and the bridges and make sure that they remain safe. As Carlos mentioned, our goal is to have zero fatalities. And the salt does a very good job at what it's intended to do. Normally they're chloride based, they dissolve in water, they produce a solution that has a depressed freezing point, and it resists the formation of ice, and it prevents bonding of ice to the pavement surface. However, over time, chloride ions gradually diffuse downward into the bridge deck. And as they diffuse downward, they collect in critical concentrations that can cause corrosion of the reinforcing steel when they exceed the allowable threshold. In this particular case for black bar, we typically assume two pounds of chloride per cubic yard of concrete. I want to point out that the chloride ions, in this case, diffuse through water in the concrete, and therefore it would make sense, I hope, that a wetter deck leads to a faster diffusion of these chloride ions into the concrete. When the reinforcing steel begins corroding, we see cracking. And in this case, you see a transverse crack that is accompanied by a delamination, which is evident only on the edges just to the left side of the hammer in this picture. Once the delamination fully breaks loose, then we have a complete spall or pothole. And we see in the bottom, of course, corroding rebar. And at this point, we have a rough ride. We have a compromised bridge deck. And if it's not repaired properly, it will continue to spread. I can tell you that the halo effect is very alive and well in the state of Utah. It's not just the properties of the concrete at the deck surface that influence the performance of the bridge deck. It can also be features of the bridge deck that are beneath. And in this case, I'm highlighting the effects of stay-in-place metal forms. While very convenient in many instances for construction, they present significant problems with respect to chloride-induced corrosion in particular. Think of it as, in this case, reducing the available surface area of the bridge deck from which water may evaporate after a precipitation event. If the water is unable to fully evaporate, then the deck will be wetter on average than a bridge deck without stay-in-place metal forms, and this has specific consequences on chloride concentrations. Here I'm showing you typical chloride concentration profiles for decks with stay-in-place metal forms and without stay-in-place metal forms. All of the bridges that are represented here are within a five-mile distance of each other. They have similar environmental conditions. They're all between 16 and 20 years old, approximately. And you see where the reinforcing steel would be located, approximately three inches, let's say. The chloride concentrations are two to three times greater in the decks with stay-in-place metal forms. It is for this reason that the Utah DOT no longer permits the use of stay-in-place metal forms, except in uh, extreme circumstances where their use is acceptable. This whole process of bridge deck deterioration can be explained in a slide like this, 
where we show debt condition on the x-axis and debt age, excuse me, debt condition on the y-axis and debt age on the x-axis. Let's look at these carefully. I've divided it into three phases. In the first phase, some initial settlement or shrinkage cracking may occur, but chloride ingress and carbonation, a separate mechanism of reinforcing steel corrosion, are primarily diffusion controlled. That means the chloride is progressing by going through the concrete matrix as opposed to going through cracks. Preventive maintenance treatments should be applied to retard the onset of deterioration. Conditions suitable for corrosion are attained by the end of this period. Phase two, chloride and or carbonation induced corrosion of the reinforcing steel begins. And the formation of rust causes deck damage. Maintenance and or rehabilitation is required to provide satisfactory ride quality. We know that the formation of rust generates a expansive force inside the concrete because rust is uh, approximately five to seven times larger in volume than the parent steel. And in phase three, accelerated, accelerated chloride ingress occurs through preferential pathways within damaged areas, and the deck must be replaced at this point as structural failure could be imminent. So let's talk about these particular phases in terms of a preservation strategy. Our goal, of course, is to extend the life of the bridge deck. In other words, to increase the time in state in those three phases. And so we do that by applying some treatment at some time to some bridge with the idea that we can extend the service life, improve the average condition of the deck, and reduce the life cycle cost. If we were to establish then a trigger that would indicate the end of the service life, we could then quantify the benefit associated with application of a particular treatment. Now, Josh mentioned the importance of treatment timing. I've prepared here a summary of data that indicates for bridges typical of Utah how polymer surface treatments or any surface treatment designed to stop chlorides should be applied. What you see on the y-axis is chloride concentration. This is chloride concentration at the level of the rebar at the top mat with a deck with two inch cover and it shows on the x-axis time. So we have various scenarios. The upper curve is the do-nothing curve. That, was, that would be what would be expected should we do nothing at all to the bridge deck and just allow the normal operation to occur. Chloride concentrations would increase over time. Our goal, however, is to keep the chloride concentrations always below the threshold at which corrosion would occur. And if that particular threshold is two pounds of chloride per cubic yard of concrete, then we can examine this graph and look carefully. We see which treatment year corresponds with a 100% always below the threshold. Mind you, these are real data that are based on actual bridges in Utah. I want you to see that for bridges with stay in place metal forms in a two inch cover depth, we must intervene with an overlay of some kind within one year after construction. If we delay beyond one year, then as you can see, for at least a period of time, there will be chloride concentrations at the level of the bar that exceed the threshold before finally they diffuse downward deeper into the bridge deck. This is the basis then for looking at a variety of scenarios using the same technique, and we find out that the value ranges from one year to 15 years in the best case, which is without stay in place metal forms and a cover depth of three inches. And I've made a note here, each additional half inch of cover beyond two inches allows an extra two years for decks with stay in place metal forms and five years for decks without stay in place metal forms before a surface treatment must be placed to prevent future accumulation of chlorides. So this becomes now a basis for making decisions. There are a number of different kinds of surface treatments that are available, bituminous, epoxy, polyester. There are also latex modified micro silica type overlays. The intention with these, of course, is to prevent chlorides from entering the concrete bridge deck. I have an example for a bituminous overlay placement in Utah. This represents approximately 80 bridge decks surrounding us right here in Salt Lake City, all of which received a bituminous overlay at different stages in their life. We see in the legend that I have a curve for the bare decks. I have one for an overlay placed after 15 to 20 years, and then later 20 to 25 years, and another 25 to 30 years. Do you notice the blue line at the top? 
Do you see that there is a constant downward slope until you reach a point between 15 and 20 years where most of them received a treatment? Do you see that there's an immediate increase in the condition? And then do you also see that there's a change in the deterioration rate afterward? This is what we're trying to accomplish. Notice, however, that when the overlay placement was delayed by approximately five or 10 years, the trends follow the red line, which is the bare deck. In other words, there's no obvious benefit. This further reinforces the idea that there is a proper timing for different treatments. And when we're concerned about chloride ingress, we need to make sure that we've intervened before we have critical levels of chlorides in the bridge deck. So what about those bridges that are no longer eligible for the cost-effective preventive maintenance treatments? Well, they fall in stage two of this chart, and they require a little more aggressive treatment. In this case, it may be localized repairs. In Utah, we require a removal of six inches beyond a delamination or damaged area. They will be saw cut and removed with a lightweight jackhammer, usually 30 pounds, and the steel will be exposed like this and cleaned before the repair is made. I'll point out that this would be an excellent opportunity to install galvanic anodes to prevent a future return of the maintenance crew to fix this in another five or 10 years. So depending on the life, the intended service life of the structure, placement of galvanic anodes could be very useful. If the damage is more extensive, then perhaps hydro demolition, such as shown in this picture, would be appropriate. And in this case, the hydro demolition machine is carefully calibrated to remove and profile the intact concrete while removing all deteriorated concrete. And so it becomes a variable depth removal tool where the deteriorated concrete comes out and we profile the existing good quality intact concrete and prepare a, a surface that can then be overlaid with a overlay of your choice. Six years later, here's what this bridge deck looked like after repair. We have also developed recommendations for the timing of this procedure, scarification and overlay. And again, it's divided between decks with stand place metal forms and decks without. You see in the first category, the maximum time that you can wait is six years for bridges typical of those in Utah, or in the second category, 18 years. And so there's a little bit larger window for this more aggressive treatment. So how about the third category? In this case, we need to replace the bridge deck. And in the state of Utah, we still continue to use a lot of green bar, the epoxy coated bar. We hope that our contractors are being careful with it that they're not damaging it as they install it, that there are not pliers strikes and rib scrapes and unrepaired field cuts because those all cause concentrated corrosion. But we've found some improved performance with the use of epoxy coated bar. I'll also point out that this is or can be a great opportunity to install or embed sensors in the new concrete bridge decks that allow monitoring of internal moisture or electrical conductivity or temperature that might give you an idea about performance and the ingress of chlorides, for example. So the entire purpose of this preservation strategy is to apply the right treatment to the right bridge at the right time. And I've shown a picture here of a bridge deck that has a, uh, an overlay on it. The overlay is partially disbonded. Does this need a treatment? Yes, it does. Would it be as simple as repairing the overlay? Well, it depends. How long has the bridge deck been like this? How many winters have occurred? How much salt has penetrated that opening in the surface treatment? Are there delaminations lurking beneath the surface? Some of these are difficult to determine without something more than visual inspection. How about this bridge, bituminous overlay? Does it need a repair? I see cracking in the bituminous overlay. There's also a membrane, though, beneath that asphalt. Is it leaking? How do I know? Can I guess? Would it be 10% delaminated? Or instead, is it 10% intact? Knowing in advance the condition of a bridge deck can help us determine the appropriate treatment to apply to a given bridge deck at a given time. And so we need a variety of tools to assess concrete bridge decks. And I've divided them in three categories. Rebar protection has to do with concrete cover thickness and the quality of that concrete cover. 
as well as the quality of the rebar coating that surrounds the rebar itself. Rebar corrosion has to do with the activity of the corrosion. Is it active or not? And finally, deck damage has to do with delamination presence, depth, right, and also spalling. So let me show you some pictures of my favorite, if you will, condition assessment tools. This is the cover meter. And while it's useful for measuring the overall cover depth, it's also very useful for knowing the exact position of the reinforcing steel so that we can either miss it or hit it deliberately in future testing. This is an example of when we would want to deliberately hit the bar. Here we see green coating. We know it's epoxy coated. And to measure the electrical continuity of the reinforcing steel and determine whether the epoxy is doing its job, we drill another hole just like this on the opposite corner of the test area and simply measure the electrical resistance between the two. If it's infinite resistance, according to our meter, the epoxy is intact. If it's not, for example, perhaps 50 ohms or something, then we know that the epoxy has been compromised. Chloride concentration is, of course, critical for making important decisions about rehabilitation and, pavement, uh, and preservation. In this picture, we see the use of a percussive type hammer drill to extract concrete powder in lifts, generally one half to one inch deep. And um, the powder is then collected and taken to the laboratory for titration. And after the powder is collected and the tools and the hole are cleaned, we proceed to another lift. In this picture, I'm deliberately showing the use of different sized drill bits with progressing depth because we want to avoid contamination of deeper samples with upper concrete that might be scraped during the sampling process. Here is the impedance apparatus. This is a vertical impedance technology developed at BYU. This one is unique in that it relies on the principle that if electrical current can flow from the surface of the bridge deck to the reinforcing steel, then chloride ions can do the same. And so this is a nice measure of the total protection that's afforded a reinforcing steel. It includes the protection from the coating on the bar, the concrete cover, and any surface treatments that may be intact. Here's half cell potential. This is a much more familiar technology. It gives an idea instantaneously whether the reinforcing steel is actively corroding or not. And I put this picture in about chaining. Chaining is a very useful tool, especially for small areas. It produces a very dull, hollow sound as it's drug across a, a delaminated area compared to a more high-pitched ringing sound across intact concrete. However, these chains weigh about 20 pounds and doing a, a, a large area is difficult and so I prefer to use an automated impact echo machine such as this, also developed at BYU, that can readily generate in the field a map of all the delaminations simply by driving across the bridge. Once we identify delaminations, it's useful to know the depth of them, whether they're at an interface between an overlay or perhaps located down at the top mat of reinforcing steel, and so we can take cores to answer those kinds of questions. Now let me just show you a quick case study that highlights the integration of this kind of data. This is a bridge that has 11 spans. It's almost a third of a mile long at 14, 25 feet. It's 28 and a half feet wide. That's a total of 40,000 square feet. It was built in 1972, one year later received a concrete overlay, and then approximately 30 years later received an epoxy overlay. Right now this picture shows a west looking view. Here's the center of the deck at the pinnacle. You see in the background a number of railroad tracks, and you also see significant repairs at the top of the bridge in the driving lanes. Continued view to the east shows the remainder of the road. Now this bridge was in fact ready for treatment. It needed to be rehabilitated. And the question was, what's the appropriate scope of work? In this case, I'm showing you maps developed on this bridge deck. The top one shows impedance. The idea is that we want a lot of resistance to electrical flow from the top surface to the rebar. In that case, we're looking for blue. You notice there's a zone that's affected just off center to the left at about 600 feet. Notice as you look in the next Diagram down, half cell potential. Anything orange or red is actively corroding. And then the final one is the impact echo results showing the occurrence of delamination. That particular zone at about 600 feet consistently showing lack of protection, active corrosion, and existing damage 
we labeled as section F. And as you can see in this particular schematic at the bottom, it fell into the category right here of having greater than 30% delamination or patching, more than 30% of the area actively corroding. And this particular span was then chosen for a deck replacement, whereas rehabilitation of the rem remainder of the deck was appropriate. Now I want to point out at the top that we used all of the maps that I just showed you to strategically select locations for chloride concentration testing and coring. That way, those more time-consuming uh, tests were not relying simply on random selection, but they were very carefully guided. And so, in the end, we were able to generate, if you will, descriptions based on the percentage of the deck area of what was happening on the bridge deck and isolate the, the areas where we may have simply delamination of the overlay versus delamination that was coming from chloride-induced corrosion of the reinforcing steel. And then Utah DOT was able to generate a solution for repair of this bridge deck. This is to demonstrate before and after. This is the impact echo map. We returned to it after the completion of the repairs, and you'll see just a couple of uh, anomalies in the bottom map. Those happen to be when the impact echo machine hit a catch basin and indicated a different acoustic signal. But this demonstrates that the contractor was able to remove all of the delamination. And so in summary, there are three main points. Bridge deck performance is affected by design, construction, and preservation actions. And therefore, a holistic approach to bridge management should include all of those. Number two, understanding concrete bridge deck deterioration is critical for selecting appropriate condition assessment techniques. We need to make sure that the tests that we perform will allow us to differentiate among different conditions. And number three, condition assessment data can be used to guide decisions about preservation, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. And of course, as Josh indicated, our goal now with the upcoming summer season is to complete a number of additional bridge tests to better quantify the effects of different treatments in different conditions and be able to develop a framework that can be used for decision making within the DOT. Thank you very much.